it's great to have you, uh, Afshin. Um, uh, welcome to U.S. Can Tech. Uh, we are a platform dedicated to bringing U.S. and Canadian technology companies together, uh, hopefully uh, finding investors in the U.S. Uh, for uh, startup tech companies in Canada or vice versa, uh, yes. whatever uh, whatever uh, uh, works. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of have you explain a little bit about yourself, uh, how you ended up in this role, and then kind of tell us a little bit about AIS and what AIS's goals are uh, this coming year and in the coming future. Thank sure. you. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much, Ahria, for having me on uh, your uh, podcast. It's a, it is a podcast, is it not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. it is now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what, la- what the label works, but I'll take whatever okay. I can get. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. And thank you for continued support of uh, you know what we do and uh, wishing to learn more. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur and uh, I've been around the block since I was 17 doing various kinds of businesses here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, I'm an avid learner, so I like to learn uh, from everyone and I like to learn everything. Um, There was a point uh, in my career after going through some, uh, you know, corporate jobs and uh, having some different businesses, I thought, you know what, of my experiences together and I want to start doing business consulting. So I started doing that and it went very well. And uh, I had a lot of clients who were startups. So one day I was sitting in my office and uh, we had a few different businesses running out of this office. We had a private equity fund. We had uh, my consulting business, an accounting firm and a mortgage firm, all out of a big office. So um, Robert Walhedi walks in and he wanted to see somebody in the office. So I greeted him and he said, "Uh, can I talk to someone? So I said, yes, but they're running a little bit late. So have a seat. Let's have a chat. So he started telling me about what he does and I told him about what I do and uh, we started talking and it just took off from there. And uh, lo and behold, uh, a few months later, uh, we are all packed up, five of us going to uh, China, to Shanghai to promote AIS. We came back from Shanghai and then I became the uh, CEO of the company. Back then, there were about six people working at the company. Right now, there's 53 of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, AIS has a vision to have a practical robot for every task. Mm -hmm. And the way we would like to achieve this vision is to create a series of modules. And we have created uh, modules and we've created a module library. And these modules will help us in reducing the development time and development costs of new robots significantly. And we take a very practical approach to uh, robotics. We believe uh, robots that are practical are the ones that will take over the market. So uh, we have started uh, creating two different robots, uh, which are ready for commercialization now. And uh, we have a few other products in our pipeline. And we focused uh, heavily on uh, creating and capturing the intellectual property that comes out of everything we do. So we do have a total of 80 patents that we've filed, but 11 of them have been granted. And uh, there is around more than a thousand unique claims to inventions amongst those patents. Wow, so when you said you launched and you started, uh, I mean, what was the trigger? I mean, did you all assess the market and said there aren't enough practical robots to go around? I think most people, when they, when they see your uh, technology a little bit, it reminds them of uh, the Amazon uh, robots that are moving things around in a, in a factory. Mm-hmm. So how is this distinguished from that technology? Let me um, share my screen with you if you're okay. Sure. Uh, there's a little animation on the first page of our website and it helps explain what I mean by practicality. You know, uh, when you buy a robot and uh, technology changes and you need to upgrade that robot, uh, usually it's pretty close to impossible to do that. You'd have to scrap it and, uh, and go buy a new one. With our approach to robotics, which is the standardization of robotics and using modularity, as you can see in this animation, if we want to upgrade any part of the robot, it's as easy as what you see here. We can take out that module, we can upgrade it, put it back. 
-hmm. Now, uh, when COVID started, uh, we took our uh, nursery and greenhouse robot and we changed it into a COVID disinfectant robot, which is what we see here. And that animation showed how we did that. Mm -hmm. So our modules are both software and hardware modules. Mm -hmm. And they create practical robots that never go obsolete because they're upgradable. And they create robots that can easily be uh, repaired because you don't need to ship the entire robot uh, for repair. You can just take that module out, send it to us, and we send you a new module if uh, we want to upgrade it or service it. So wow. uh, that's the difference between us and everybody else in the market today. Wow, that's it's kind of like a... I would say IKEA furniture, but it's not it. I'm just saying easily you just components match or Lego... Uh, yes. like uh, some of the Swedish technology where you uh, connect it and it just kind of continuously adaptable, evolvable to the task at hand. So you're not yeah. trying to essentially say this is only a medical device or a, or a horticulture device. It is whatever you need to supplement uh, robotic assistance technology. Yes. You guys can uh, uh, connect it. You can make it happen. But you also mentioned something interesting, technology, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, software, hardware. I know that was a big question for a lot of investors. How does that come into play? Do you consider yourself a software company or a hardware company? Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, businesses out there who are categorized as robotics uh, businesses, but uh, they specialize in a very niche area of robotics. For example, they're building vision or they're building AI or uh, they're writing codes for a certain task. Um, uh, There are not that many autonomous robotics companies out there who are creating everything from scratch, who are creating their own uh, autonomous mobile robots and who are also writing the software for managing those robots. We are one of those companies. Uh, We uh, take a holistic approach and because of the grand vision that we have, uh, which is having a practical robot for every task, we know that it would work best if we own all of our own assets Mm. rather than try to build on others. Of course, that being said, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So, uh, you know, we still do buy processors, we still do buy camera vision and, you know, we buy off the shelf parts because it's just more economic and it's better to do that. But uh, besides those off the shelf parts, everything else we create from scratch, both software and hardware. Wow. So that's kind of, I mean, there are other robotics companies in the world. Yes. Uh, who do you see kind of as your general competition? What is the competitive landscape for such a product? Well, um, there's two ways to look at us. Okay, and let me share my screen again with you. Uh, So um, this is again on our website, so you can go on uh, our website and see this. So let's uh, look at this product and then talk about the competition. So when you see this robot, this is a UV disinfectant robot. Mm -hmm. And what this robot does is it disinfects... uh, hospitals, uh, malls, hotel rooms, uh, washrooms, and uh, it kills 99.99% of the bacteria and viruses. So uh, if you look at this product, there are some competitors out there for this product, but none of those competitors uh, compete with us as a company. They might compete with one of our products But our products are a testament to our bigger vision, which is to have a practical robot for every task. Mm -hmm. And we might create products in certain competitive markets where there are other players in there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we approach it through our modularity uh, rather than creating one robot that is a one piece equipment. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between us and any competitors who are competing with us on a specific uh, uh, product, yeah. but as far as um, competitors have to robotics, um, I'm not aware of any, because our goal is to standardize robotics through modularity, yeah, yeah. and to create an ecosystem where all robotic companies would be able to build on each other's um, uh, inventions and yeah. uh, to create more, better, faster, cheaper, practical robots. 
And, and when you say autonomous in this way, and this is a, a one robot moving around the mall that I assume is after hours, um, would this thing be kind of stationed in a in a location and somebody pushes a button and it goes on its route uh, uh, on, without yes. human management or how does that work? Uh, let me show you another video to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes and no. So, uh, we have the ability to uh, manage these robots uh, autonomously or uh, to manage them um, uh, by manually by using uh, joysticks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in this video, and I'm going to forward this video, fast forward it to a place, uh, we are um, using the autonomous feature of the robot for the robot to navigate through a room. And so we have an app and on the app you map the room and then you tell the robot to get to work. And uh, based on the map you've created for the robot, it goes around and autonomously uh, disinfects this room. Now, in certain areas, uh, you need to guide the robot. For example, the robot cannot open the door by itself. Sure. So in those times, we do have a manual uh, way of directing the robot. Mm -hmm. And let me bring that up for you. So there we go. So right after this, you'll see that there's an operator who opens the door and says, okay, robot, we need to leave and go to another place and continue working. Mm -hmm. So he manually moves to the washroom and then closes the door to the washroom and says, get to work. And okay, the robot and starts. And this is the type of UV light that's harmful to humans, so you you can't have a human right next to it, right? Of course, yes. Yeah. What you, was the type of UV? Yes. Uh, well, this is UVC. Uh, okay. That's the type of UV, and of course, it has uh, different strengths and different kinds of lamps. Uh, that uh, some of them are a little bit stronger, some of them are a little bit more mellow. Uh, but regardless, humans should not be exposed to this UV without protective gear. Sure. Sure. Yes. So uh, this is just the adaptation you made this past year because of COVID and also because so much national attention, global attention on uh, disinfection, that kind of stuff. Um, yes. But obviously this thing has other applica applications. You showed the moving pots. What are, I want to say, low hanging fruit? What are the closest industries that you think your modules will be most uh, sought after? Well, uh, when we started uh, looking at building robots, our minds and hearts were in helping horticulture and agriculture industry. And so, uh, and you know, I'm going to share my screen with you. Sure, sure. I don't mind. No, no so, I love the anime. Uh, Who doesn't like the animation? I love it. Yeah. So here is um, the first robot that we started to put together. So these robots were built for greenhouses and nurseries. And we actually received orders and we were in the process of delivering these robots when COVID started. And at that point, we decided that uh, we can use this opportunity to show the market that our robots are actually modular. And we can uh, recondition our robots into disinfectant robots from what they're doing here. So going back, sorry, just a moment, let me, okay, there we go. So going back to your question, what's our lowest hanging fruit and what's the market we want to get into? Um, uh, the horticulture market, the disinfecting uh, market and um, uh, the logistics market and the warehouse market. We have robots in our pipeline for all of them. And we do have patents for other markets uh, and other types of products that we'll be working on. And um, the lowest hanging fruit at this point in time is our uh, COVID disinfectant robot, of course, because there is a lot of demand in the market for it. Sure. And uh, and that's the one that uh, we need to focus on today. Um, nurseries and greenhouses have been very patient with us, waiting for uh, these COVID uh, bans and the blockages at the border to be lifted, mm -hmm. so we can go back to visiting the uh, orders that we've received and start delivering on those. 
Okay. So let's get to the investment side a little bit. So okay. uh, you've patented all aspects of uh, this t software uh, technology. Um, now you're in a phase where you're looking for additional investment. You have some uh, investment or however which way the Canadian government supports its companies. Um, seed capital, I guess I can call it. But now you're looking for the next level. So maybe you can explain how, how does that work? And yes. at what point will you, uh, do you think you'll ever produce uh, in, in scale uh, these products or will it mm. only be through a partnership with a manufacturer? Well, uh, right now we are assembling all the robots in-house ourselves. Okay. And uh, eventually, of course, we would benefit a lot from uh, a partnership, a strategic partnership, where uh, a company would be able to come in, help us to scale and uh, produce at mass. Um, uh, that being said, we are open to uh, uh, different approaches to, to getting this done. Uh, we are open to uh, scaling our team and continuing to uh, assemble in-house. We are also open to uh, finding a strategic partner who can help us manufacture. Uh, it, it comes down to uh, how much money we raise and uh, what source do we raise it from and what is that common vision for the company that our uh, significant uh, stakeholders and investors would uh, would want to see. Sure. Uh, but ultimately, we would want to create uh, more modules. We would want to start uh, creating uh, new kind of robots and we would like to file more patents and capture the intellectual property that's generated uh, sure. from our activities. I'm going to ask about China uh, in a little bit, uh, and then okay. I'll get to what your ideal investor looks like. Um, I mean, you can't talk about technology nowadays and not stumble across what China is doing, has done, or may do. Yes. So how do you feel foreign competition uh, or partnership uh, uh, from China will play into your plans? Uh, I think that there are real tangible opportunities uh, in China. And uh, we have talked to a few different entities in China. And uh, of course, uh, manufacturing in China is uh, less expensive uh, compared to North America. It's still less expensive. I'm not sure how, how long it will yeah. be because um, uh, in China, it's getting a little bit more expensive too right now. Uh, prices are going up. Uh, so we are open to having relationships and strategic partnerships uh, with uh, Chinese entities, uh, both in the way of investment and manufacturing uh, partnerships. Okay. But how about... Uh, I mean, there's also China's famous for a lot of things, including patent infringement and all kinds of things that the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce and uh, or even Canadian governments can't undo. Uh, mm -hmm. How, apart from partnerships, how do you see China, uh, potentially bad actors in China, uh, playing a hand in your future? Yeah, I, I believe there are bad actors everywhere. Yeah, I think... Uh, time ago when everything was made in Japan, do you remember? Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> and then it started changing because yeah. Japanese goods got more expensive yeah. and, you know, the nature of uh, how they handled themselves changed. I think that's what's happening with China today. Sure. I think uh, Chinese are realizing that they need to play on a different playing field because uh, they can now do that. Yeah. And so um, uh, there is a whole lot more diligence. There are patent uh, attorneys in China who work across the borders. We have actually filed patents in China ourselves. Okay, wow. So, um, so the Chinese government is uh, promoting heavily the compliance with international patents because that's how uh, their own patent portfolios will be valued a whole lot more. Elsewhere. Wow. Okay. Yes, elsewhere. So uh, there, there is definitely a shift in the way uh, the Chinese market is managing itself yeah. and there's always the risk of infringement whether you're in china or elsewhere yeah. but uh, the conception of a china being notorious in uh, yeah, <laughs> infringing yeah. on patents uh, holds true in certain areas and certain uh, types of uh, industries uh, but uh, i don't think that's one of the biggest considerations we need to have in mind if we are going to choose a partnership as that's long as good. as long as there is a reputable company that we are partnering with we should be fine yeah yeah that's good to know um 
So now let me get to the punchline. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, what does your ideal investor look like? What is the financial goals, investment goals of AIS today? Well, um, we have been looking at three different angles. Mm. One angle, which uh, right now is uh, really uh, hot and everybody is going, is the public markets. Mm -hmm. uh, another angle would be a, a financial player uh, who would be able to also contribute uh, to our end goal. And the third angle is uh, a strategic partner mm -hmm. would either be upstream or downstream from us. Either they would be a great uh, client or customer for our products or uh, they would want to supply us with uh, with the, what they produce mm -hmm. uh, or help us manufacture or distribute. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been exploring all those three angles. We are still in the very early stages of mapping how we want to take that step. I believe uh, depending on which one gets more traction, uh, that's the path we will take. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in short, I mean, if somebody comes in with a million dollars or five million, you're not going to say no. You'll you'll find a way to <laughs> uh, uh, to make it work. Um, and so, as an investor, uh, as to the extent you can make these representations, what do you? What is the attraction for an investor? Given again everything we just talked about, competitive landscape, China, yes. uh, software, hardware, so many places money can go. The economy. Yes. You know, if I have a $5 million thing in front of me, why would I invest in AIS and not something else? Mm -hmm. Well, um, AIS has a big vision. Yeah. So the investor who would want to consider us as an investment opportunity would have to buy into that vision. Sure. sure. And once they buy into that vision and once they see that we have tangibly taken proper steps to achieve that vision mm -hmm. and they get excited, I think then uh, they would choose us as an opportunity they want to be engaged in. Sure. But uh, why would they want to invest in us? Uh, I think it takes a certain type of investor to to want to invest with us or want to invest in technology altogether, right? Sure, sure. And, uh, and I think it comes down to what's the vision of the company, who's the team, how well are they executing what they're doing to date, and uh, also the intellectual property portfolio. Yeah. That is something that's extremely attractive for investors because that's sure. what protects what we're trying to do here and uh, allows us to scale well into the future uh, while owning that little piece of the uh, sure. uh, technology market. That's probably the, one of the most attractive things that whatever people are buying is protected and yes. you can demonstrate to uh, any would-be investor that Here's all the different ways we're protecting this technology. Here's how we fit in the market. Here's uh, maybe product competition, but not necessarily company competition uh, yes. because uh, our products are adaptable. Uh, and the COVID uh, you know, uh, robot is just one, uh, I want to say, opportunistic uh, product that evolved simply because of the times we live in next year. There could yes. be a different priority and, and a different um, adaptation that AIS could quickly uh, get to. Uh, so a would-be investor would may help you uh, uh, scale up some of uh, increased patent investments, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, at, at some point maybe even uh, build more products in-house uh, mm -hmm. and maybe eventually uh, be a bridge to a partnership with a, uh, a, um, a manufacturing company to build 5,000 mm -hmm. of these things rolling yeah. off going to hotels and God knows what else, you know, a hoard, a nursery lands and this. Okay. So I'm just I like that. To, I like that vision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just trying to play out where everything I've heard. Where does it go? So yeah. uh, an investor understands here's what we're talking about. Apart from all the details and the number crunching that would happen and all yes. the, you know, I want to say shark tank thinking that people yes. do. We're like, okay, well, when do I get my money back? Yes. That's what I want to know. If I'm going to be yes. $5 million, just because yeah. I'm rich doesn't mean I got $5 million to lose. Yes, I want to know when I'm course. getting my money back. And as of one course. investor once told me, what is the shortest route to money? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I go, like, oh, okay, that's why you're, you're a bazillionaire because you yeah. think about these things uh, on top of being excited about technology. They think yeah. about how do I get the money back uh, and what return in comparison to other investments. Yes. So it's a very valid question any investor would have. So I think we've uh, given sufficient um, 
uh, put sufficient meat on the bones so people can understand it a little bit more. And then if they have more questions, of course, they're going to get to your website. And your website is? Uh, www.ai-systems.ca. Okay, we'll have it on uh, on the bottom of the screen as people can get to it. And uh, we'll have Perfect. your contact info directly on the screen they can get to it. Afshin, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, US Can Tech, you have proven you. the uh, Canada Can Tech. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to be having more of these conversations with you very soon. Thanks so much.